Good evening. It's a blessing to be in the house of God tonight. It's a blessing to worship together in this way. And I, I just uh, feel it's an extra special privilege and a blessing we have to be gathered in this way tonight. And I just want to praise God for the opportunity. Uh, we're blessed tonight to have friends with us. Especially blessed to have Mervyn and Lorraine with us tonight, our guest speaker for the week. It's a privilege to have them come and share God's word with us. And so we're going to give him a time here after a bit to, to do just that. And I just want to encourage all of us to continue in prayer throughout the week. 
I was blessed with that song, Sitting at the Feet of Jesus, because of uh, Brother Amos being in the hospital, and I had to think of the verse that when, when one of the members suffer, all of us suffer together with him. And so I want to recognize that this evening as a, a challenge that we as a church have, have been challenged with, and for you, Brother Amos, you have particularly been challenged with that in a physical kind of way. And we recognize that tonight. And I'd just like to, uh, from the beginning here, just make you all aware that there was an anointing service for Amos, and Omer was able to officiate that this afternoon. And uh, through that uh, was just, I think Omer was encouraged to be with them as a, a blessing with him. And so I have a scripture reading and a few words that I want to share. And then after that, I'm going to ask whoever would like to, to just gather around up here and we're going to sing a song or two and also just have a, a bit of an open mic time where we can, we can share with Brother Amos and just uh, lift up his hands tonight. And I'm going to read a special psalm, a special psalm to me, Psalm 91. It's a familiar psalm. And I know this is a psalm that I've gone to different times through challenging times. There are things I don't fully understand about uh, the promises and, and the psalm here. And, and tonight, in, in many ways, this is perplexing, I believe, when, when someone is, is sick, even nigh unto death. Uh, you know, I, we know Amos is, is, uh, is fighting for life, and we recognize that tonight at the same time. I just want to say to you, Brother Amos, that although some people have given up on you, we have not. Yes, we leave it to God, but we trust that he will carry you through. So I'm going to read these, uh, this psalm to all of us here and to you, Amos, particularly tonight. Uh, just, just rest in these promises. It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. <clears throat> I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I, do, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. God bless the reading of his word. And so there are several promises here that I particularly want to point out. In verse 6 it says, well verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence, that walketh in darkness. The word pestilence there, another translation would be infectious diseases. Thou shalt not be afraid of infectious diseases that walk in darkness, nor for the destruction that walketh at noonday. And it mentions this word pestilence twice here. Well, the first, first time it was in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And, and you know, I've already made that, uh, used that word, and, and is... How can we apply that to us today and to the situation that you face, Amos? I, you know, in some ways we could say, well, you're not supposed to have this. And however, there are, uh, there are so many promises in Scripture that God provides a measure of deliverance from sickness. And I believe that, you know, we're, you know some people may, may say that, well, we can apply this in a spiritual sense. And yes, we want to apply it in a spiritual sense. But I think we can also... We also have the right, while we're in our physical bodies, to apply this in a physical way as well. And, I, and, and I'll be the first to admit, I don't fully understand how all of this works. Yet tonight, I would, you know, 
I would just like to apply this in that way that God will protect us for sure absolutely in a spiritual sense but I believe that God uh, also has uh, our best interests in mind in every way including physically and so tonight we we I, I just want to commit some of these verses to you Amos that God will see you through God will protect you and and I trust that God will deliver you. I know that God will deliver you in a spiritual way, and I trust that God will deliver you in a physical way as well. And we are and will continue to pray to that end. And to uh, the family, to Amos and Sarah, to Sarah, you especially, and to your family, we are here for you. We will continue to lift you up in prayer. And, and I believe that uh, this is just an intense battle for you all as well. And, and, and we just want you to know we love you guys. We're praying for you. And we uh, will continue to be there for you in any way that we can. So God bless you. God give you as a family so much grace and so much strength. The, world, the injustice of this world is just uh, sometimes is just maddening. But, and so we recognize that. We recognize that as well tonight. But we also recognize that God is more powerful than that. And God will see us through the injustices of this world. And so may God bless you. May God give each one of you the, the strength and the courage to press on. And I just, I just hope, I trust that in all of this, we're going to learn better what it's like to sit at the feet of Jesus, to learn from him, to, 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 uh, to glean from his word, to glean from who he is, and to just uh, learn in a new and a refreshing way how to, uh, how to latch on to what God has for us through Christ. So at this time, I'm going to invite, I'm going to invite the congregation to come. And if you're, uh, if you want to stay sitting in the front, you're welcome to do that as well. But I'd like enough of people here at least that we can sing a song or two. And also, if uh, you have a word that you'd like to share, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's people watching in here tonight, and and we, we're trusting that Amos has strength to watch and and be blessed here this evening. So. Let's sing a song or so. Uh, praise the Lord. All right, so uh, let's sing a song, and then we're just going to have a time of open mic here and sharing and, and give you, uh, those of you that especially that feel led to or close to Amos, to just share a word of encouragement, a word of blessing. Uh, that's God. Yeah, if you could just lead us in a song or two and, and just kind of take time in between. Let's do at least, I don't know, three or four songs. and. And I know we can't all speak, but I, I'm sure God is nudging a few of you. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, let's sing All My Ways. Um, and if you don't know it, the lyrics will be in the back. But I think we've sang it enough that we... Uh, In days of peace and days of rest, in times of loss and loneliness, the rich or poor, your word is true, that all my ways are known to you. No trial has come beyond your hand, no step.
Amen. So I think instead of passing this around, why don't we just step right up here, step up to the mic. If anyone has a prayer, uh, or some encouragement, let's go. Okay, good evening, Amos. Uh, we love you and we miss you tonight. Um, you know, God is light tonight. God is good. Um, in him is no darkness at all. We live in a world that is fallen. We live in all of us, and we are trusting in Him, and we trust God tonight and His promises that He will heal your body according to His will. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you, Amos, and just keep pressing on. We are praying that you would get strong and God would heal you. Uh, here is a scripture verse that I would quote to you. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord lift his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. God bless you, Amos. And we're praying and warrioring. And God is the healer and we believe it. We believe it. Brother Amos, I just want to bless you tonight. That's, uh, that scripture that James read, Psalm 91, uh, he that dwelleth in the secret place, that's been our prayer the last couple of days for you. And every, everywhere that, that it says he, we were putting Amos. Uh, we put in Amos, and we prayed that as a family. He will cover Amos with his feathers, and under his wings shall Amos trust. And I just, I just want you to take that psalm, and if somebody can read that to you and put your name in that every time, those are promises from God. And in, in Psalm 107, verse 20, it says, God sent his word and healed them. You know, the word of God is the most powerful thing to heal your body. And we're, we're believing. We're believing in faith for you. God bless you. We miss you. Good evening, Amos. I want to thank you for the friend that you've been to me. And I also think of you as a man of stability. And I want to honor you as that. Uh, also, thank you for the many times over the years that we've been at your house. Uh, you've always had a spirit of hospitality, and I really appreciate that about you. Uh, I'm going to also say that over the years we have been a lot of fun memories. We have done a lot together. We sat together in church. Uh, I have some really fun memories. Keep fighting for breath of life. I'm going to read another one that was read earlier tonight. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up your countenance upon you and shall give you and give you peace. We love you. Yes, Amos, we're praying for you, but we're also praying for you, Sarah, and um, for all you children. We're praying supernatural peace and rest and strength over you tonight. God bless you and we love you. Yeah, to Amos and the rest of the Esh family. Um, this next song is Jesus Strong and Kind. It's a simple song, but it has a, uh, it has a uh, powerful, simple, powerful message. Jesus said that if I thirst, I should come.
I had the privilege of being with Amos this afternoon. And with COVID restrictions, they only allowed two people in. So I myself went in and, and their son, Timmy. And let me, let me tell you, COVID has restrictions, but it does not restrict the presence of God. Amen. The presence of God was so real in that room tonight that you hardly wanted to walk away from it. And um, Amos did say that I'm to say thank you to the church for what you're all doing. He appreciates it very much. And Amos, again, I love you and God bless you. Yeah, Amos, there's a verse that, uh, which, um, yeah, we all love you. We're fighting for you. Um, and I just want to say I'm proud of your family, seeing how your children are fighting for you as well. God bless you so much. I'd like to just pray for you real, uh, here real quick before uh, we move on. Thank you, Lord, for Amos tonight. I, I just, God, I just pray that you would work a miracle. God, we're... We're expecting a miracle from you tonight for, for Amos. And Lord, especially as I think of his lungs, I think of the oxygen needed. God, you're in control of that. Tonight we ask that you would just strengthen the walls of those lungs. Pour your oxygen in there, God. We know that you are the breath of life. And tonight we pray that you just breathe that into him. Thank you, Jesus. You're a God of God. You're the creator of all things. And we honor and worship you tonight and glorify your name. Amen. Brother Amos, you've been a real blessing to me throughout the years, and especially these last years in our Bible study. I thank you for what you've done uh, for us. And I, we know that there's many battles won through praise, and I'm just going to read a few verses here. In Psalm 146, says, Praise ye the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto God while I have any my being. Put your trust in put not your not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth; he returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the Lord of God, the God of Jacob, for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. May God bless. Uh, we'll, sing, we'll sing Living Hope. <clears throat> How great the chasm.
rest of you stand, and we're going to close this out with a short prayer, especially on behalf of Amos. And you all just want to lift your hands, and we're praying together. We're agreeing together. Let's pray. Father, we lift our hearts and our hands to you tonight. Lord, we thank you that you have all things in your power and your control. And Lord, tonight we just give Amos to you. Father, we give his body to you. Father, we pray, as Chet prayed, that you would just bring healing and life. Father, that you would just bless him this evening with vibrance in his spirit. Lord, that tonight he could worship you in his spirit. Father, I pray that you would hold back the forces of evil from tormenting him tonight. But Father, just give him victory in his spirit. And Lord, we just pray that through that you would bring healing to his body. We commit him to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Take your seats. All right. There's nothing that lifts their spirits like singing and praising God, and, and I'm so grateful for that avenue that we have this evening. Let's continue to be in prayer uh, for each other, and especially for this week. And tonight, I'm, I'm just grateful to have Brother Mervyn with us. He is from Illinois, Trinity Congregation. Uh, we got to know each other, I don't know, probably about 14 years ago, and I think I'm correct. We, uh, we would attend most of the annual ministers' meetings, and if I'm not mistaken, we met each other for the first time, both of us, in the same place in Kansas. And we might have to re renew that later tonight. But anyway, we had a lot of things in common, just our, you know, s some similar backgrounds, and, and so uh, we touch base from time to time here and there. So don't know each other that well, but yet in kind of a unique little way. And so tonight I'm grateful to have you here. I'm looking forward to, while it's a short week, looking forward to what, has, what God has for us through you. I want to say our cups are turned up. And would you come and allow God to use you to fill those cups tonight? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for Brother Mervyn. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for bringing them safely here. Yes. Thank you for giving them health and strength and life here tonight. And I just pray your blessing upon him as he shares God's word with us. Mm -hmm. Father, open our hearts. Lord, bring revival to each and every one of our hearts here tonight. Lord, that we could uh, just have our cups filled with the precious word of God, that yes, you could Lord. receive the glory and the honor of the praise that is due your name. So, Father, mm -hmm. we commit this evening to you. In Jesus' name, amen. What time do you want me to quit? When you're done. Okay. <laughs> I was just sitting here just thinking about, uh, wow, uh, what would it be like to be in the hospital without church? What would it be like where you don't have family of God together around? And it, it, it made me, um, you know, I'm, I, a lot of you I don't know, and, and it just, there was something about it that I was like, wow, I, I, I want to be a part of that. You know, I want to be a part of that where the family of God comes together to rally around a person. And that is what makes church, right? That's what makes church. You know, a man in our area used to, uh, he'd come up to me sometimes and he'd grab me by the shirt collar right here and he'd say, now you preach like it was going to be your last time. And, okay. So uh, I'd like to do that tonight, but I'd also want for you to listen like it may be your last time. Maybe you're the last sermon you ever get to hear on this side of eternity. I don't know how it's going to be. Throughout the ages, his love is going to be revealed to us. So even then, even in part, in, in the beginning anyway, however eternity is, we will 
spend eternity learning about the love of God. And as I think about, God could have brought someone perfect to you tonight to preach to you perfectly. The right emphasis, the right, just every to bring over here to share the gospel. So he has committed to us men healed, broken men healed by Jesus Christ. This evening, I thought maybe I should put a disclaimer in. This has happened to me already where I was preaching and uh, somebody afterwards come up to the to a man and said, did you, tell, did you tell the preacher about me? The guy said, no. Well, he was even looking at me. <laughs> I'll tell you tonight that I don't know. I'm here as a free creature. I don't know anything, okay? So let's just leave the Holy Spirit have its will and way, right? Let, let him bring conviction and it's not me. He may use me and speak through me to your heart. I Pray that that would happen. This evening, my title of the message is Set Your Affections on Things Above and Not on Things of the Earth, Colossians 3. First of all, I do a little introduction. Uh, you know, family just keeps getting more precious to me as I get older. There's nothing I like more than just sitting down with my family. Uh, we. This is probably a two-year-old picture. Um, this is my oldest son, our oldest son, Larry, and his wife, Cindy. They have two children. And this is Tyler here. This is my wife. This is our daughter, married to Jason. They, had, they just had a baby. In fact, it's a little hard for Grandma to be here. They just had a baby uh, a couple days ago. So, uh, yeah. And then Brian, many of you know him. He's uh, yeah, dating Marv's uh, daughter. So that's our family. It's only the only thing that we can really take with us over in glory. So here some time ago, uh, I, I, I hear people talking about life verses, and this one here came to me, Psalms 27.4 here a few years ago, and I believe it became my life verse. I have it taped over my, my desk, and it just, it, there's something about it that grabs me. This is a Psalm of David, Psalms 27 verse 4 says, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David didn't ask for a lot of things. He said, one thing have I inquired of the Lord. One thing was his desire. It wasn't about blessing his neighbor, blessing his business, whatever, whatever. It was one thing. And he said, I will seek after. Did you know the level of your desperation of seeking has to do with how precious you esteem that which you seek? Example, if I would lose my pocket knife out in the woods, uh, I wouldn't call anybody to come help me look for, to help me seek for this knife. I can go to the store and buy a new one. It's not that big a deal. But you know, one night I got a call and, and it was from my nephew and he said his child wandered off and it was cold out. It was sub-zero degree weather and there was desperation in this man's voice because he knew that the night was getting uh, later. It was getting dark and he knew that if this child was not found, there was going to be things happening that were not good, and so there was desperation in his voice. Why? Because he esteemed that precious which he sought after. Challenge. If God were to answer the five top things on your prayer list, what would change in the kingdom of God? That was just a challenge to me. What would change in the kingdom of God how do we seek him? Well, I don't know my 
Bedry did, maybe. How do we seek him? And some more verses on seeking. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. So, back to seeking. Uh, my brother... He's now passed away, but when he was about 10 years older than me, so he was a teenager, and I was like six or seven years old, and growing up on the farm, he took me to a festival we called the Broomcorn Festival in our area. It's about a place where about 30,000 people come into this town that's about 2,000 people big. So he would take me there, and I was so enamored by the things that glitter, right? Like uh, all these booths and stuff and I'd, I, I'd, I'd, I'd get caught up you know watching and he said look you gotta stay with me you gotta stay with me and okay well uh, that would last for a while and the next year I was again being sidetracked and, and uh, one time I looked around and you know I was just this little guy I looked around and, and I, couldn't, I couldn't see him anymore he wasn't there anymore and you know I'd I didn't look at hands. I was looking for a face. And, and this little boy started getting scared. He started seeking desperately for a face. And I didn't realize that he was standing over there around the corner and watching me and teaching me a lesson, I guess, to uh, stay near. And so I think God does that too sometimes. When he withdraws and allows us to really come to a point where we seek him. We don't, have you ever tried, have you ever tried having a conversation with your son and you have a candy bar or a five dollar bill in your hand and all he does is he looks at your hand because he desires the gift that you have more than the relationship. I think sometimes we can get enamored by that too. We desire the gifts more than his face and we need to seek his face. So setting affections. What is important to us? A quote from a man drinking and he lost his family, even though he had lots of money. So setting your affection, theme verse here, Colossians 3, 1, the text. If you then be risen with Christ, seek. Again, listen, seeking. Seeking those things which are above, which Christ, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Okay, so looking at affection, it says affection, a feeling of liking and caring for someone or something, tender attachment, fondness. Okay, so it has to do with your heart. Okay, affection has to do with what you set your heart on. So we want to we look at that, set, set your affections on things above. The story of two, two ship captains. The one, this is a, a, a Greek myth, but it brings out a point. The one, uh, okay, there was this island of the Cyrenes, and the Cyrenes were cannibals. They would eat papal, okay? So what would happen is, as ships would go by, and who, who have been out on the water for days and weeks and weeks and weeks, they would go by, and the, the Cyrenes would send out their most beautiful women to sing, and dance on the seashore there, and the, the sailors who were so longing, uh, you know, lonely, and, and listening to this singing became enticed, and they would go to shore. And, and as they would come to, on the shore, the men would come out from behind the rocks, and they became soup for that night. Okay? And so captains knew about this, and they didn't want to lose any of their sailors to the dreaded sirens. Many ships were actually lost at sea because the whole, the whole ship went over. And so the one captain said, I won't lose, I won't lose anyone. I won't lose anyone. And so this is what he decided he would do. He, uh, he, he, his top sailor, he said, now, how, however much I beg you, do not let me go. And, and, he, and, and he, he got like uh, uh, earplugs and things for, 
for his guys, his sailors, but he wanted to observe. So he tied, he had this top guy uh, tie him to the mast pole and, and, and told him to go down under and, and stay down until they're well past. And so he, he stood there tied to the mast pole and, and as he heard the singing of these, of these uh, women out there on the seashore he, uh, as they were going by he so longed to just jump overboard and, and, and even begged that they would let him go but see he couldn't he was tied and the top man knew that he c could not let him go until they were well past and then they came up and then loosened him and guess what not one perished there not one Okay, so that, uh, wow, that seemed to work, right? But now let me tell you about the other ship captain. He also didn't want uh, to lose any of his sailors, and so he, but he had a different plan. As they boarded, he, he brought on board some of his, the best singers, the best food that he could find, and, and, and as they got close, as they got close, he, he fixed the banquet table, he had the singers a singing, and you know, no one even noticed the things over there. Why is that? Because, see, this is the wrong statement always is that the fun is out there. No, it's not. It's in here. It's in here. And as I've noticed, as you stood here gathered, rallying around for a sick person in, in some other place, what? This is where life really is. It's not out there. Fun doesn't begin out there. Most people that go out there and come back regret. I have so many regrets from trying to have fun out there. And so, when see, we need to set our focus. I had, uh, so here some time ago, there was, we have this tree on the south side of our house, and, uh, we got a big window in our living room, and, and every spring, we, we have this um, pine trees that grow up, and every, every spring, these blackbirds come, and they love, they love sitting on this tree right by our window, and my dear wife would clean the windows, and it wasn't long, they didn't look clean, and so I decided, uh, I decided that I'm not much of a hunter, but I got me a high-powered pellet gun with a scope. And we'd, I'd sit in my gazebo with my coffee and my Bible mornings, and sometimes I'd just pick some of those off. And, uh, but I noticed when I was setting the scope, it, it said, set, a, set a, your target out there, and you, uh, and, and, you know, you shoot three times, and if you're continually to the right, and up or whatever, you know, it's a few clicks this way and a few clicks that way to get your scope set. It's important to set the scope. And so if the Bible says to set your affection, maybe, maybe the reason I'm missing the mark is because my affections need to be reset. Maybe the affections have to be a, a few clicks to the left and a few clicks up so, so, so that I start hitting, hitting, and I think it's important that we, that we observe what is our heart attached to. <laughs> Sometimes technology. So a, a, an attachment comes from the heart. Okay, the, in, in uh, Luke 4.18 it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he, it's Jesus talking, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty to them that are bruised. We know Jesus, and Jesus did come and heal blind people, but I think this is referring to a spiritual condition. Okay, obviously the broken hearted. He's not talking about a, a heart that is busted apart and, and whatever. He's talking about a spiritual condition. And so the broken hearted. See, the question is not have you been broken. The question is how have you experienced healing for your brokenness? Because we are all broken people. 2 Corinthians 3.8 says, but we all with an open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. 
couple things on the heart. A couple scriptures here. Matthew 15, 18. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. Jesus' teaching. Next verse. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. I thought the heart... Wait, I thought those, like, thoughts, evil thoughts, I thought those come from the mind. But see, your heart is attached. It's, it's where your affections come from. And so when your heart is bent, look out what's going to come out. In, in Proverbs 4, verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. See, God could have made us robots right he could have made us to where um, we wouldn't we wouldn't feel right we wouldn't feel like and and I believe some people actually try to get through life that way I, and, and and I can totally understand it we'll get into that some more you know where you don't feel pain, hurt, rejection, sorrow, you know, sadness, uh, uh, gladness, even joy, and, and, and even good emotions. See, we're, we're, he made us creatures of emotion. And I believe emotions come from the heart or is attached to the heart. And we need to, to, to see, Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. Uh, he also says, the truth will set you free, okay? The truth will set you free. Why? Because we, lies bind us up. We, if, if we start believing lies, it can bind us up. And what happens is, as we, as we experience rejection, well, you're not a real good Sunday school teacher. Uh, you don't even know what you're talking about. And, and that comes back to the Sunday school teacher, and he says in his heart, fine, I will never teach again. See, it starts to make us something that God never intended us to be. It starts to make something out of you. And, and, and it, the, the list goes on. Uh, the song leader, if, wow, he, you know, can't carry a tune in a butt, whatever. It, it, things hurt. Things hurt. You know, they, the old saying, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, and, but words uh, alone won't, or however it is, it's not true. It's not true. You know, some of those things that were said way back, you may not even remember what was said, but you remember how you felt. You remember how you felt. So God made us living creatures with a real heart, right? With a real heart. So how is it that your heart is broken? There's, there's darts, arrows that come from the enemy to break your heart. And I named these arrows. And you could probably have a message on each arrow. Until finally, your heart shatters. Your heart shatters. We were not, exp we were not created... Think about this. We were created to live eternally. We were never created to experience despair and rejection and betrayal and, and, and the feeling of regret and shame and, and all that. And without His healing grace, it will destroy us. It will destroy us. You know, my mom, I, I, I stood at the bedside of my mom as she passed away. And... The nurses have a word for this, and I can't think of it right now, but it's like when your feet start turning cold, and then the coldness moves up until... Uh, the, the nurse explained to us that what's happening is... What's happening is, is that... The heart is shutting down those areas so that it can just pump blood to the areas that are needed to try to sustain life. And... And we do that too. See, when things hurt, we start to also shut down. We start to make things safe. We start to make things safe. So, as you look at these hearts above me here, the one has steel around it, the one is, has stone around it. Um, I'll just share a little bit of my own testimony. So when I was sick, his answers. 
But it started me down a path that was not good. I, when I was five, six, seven years old going to school, I used to have a serious stuttering problem. I couldn't get certain words out, especially words that start with a B. And I tried to avoid those words. And, and, and as I would try to speak, and, and God bless little children, they weren't being mean, but they would laugh at me. And it hurt. I felt shame like, you know, there's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is like something you feel bad about doing, right? But, but shame is like this emotion that it's, it's who you are. It's who you are. And, and so with, with some other things going on, uh, I remember in school one, one day I, we were supposed to do a report about our mom and dad, and uh, I was just this little guy. And I, I, I put down, I mean, the, 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 the parents were going to come to school later for an annual meeting, they called it, and they were supposed to pick out the reports that their uh, sons and daughters wrote about them. I mean, we weren't supposed to use their names, just describe them. And, and, uh, and I, I put down for my mother, and keep in mind, I come from a family, there was eight of us boys, and we each had one sister. Uh, no, we had one sister. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, I'm next to the youngest, the youngest now, my youngest brother passed away. And I wrote about my mom, and I have no idea why I would write something like this, except maybe the fact that she doesn't like when work piles up. But I, I, I put down, my mom doesn't like to work. And I, I, my mom was not lazy. My mom took care of us children, and I publicly embarrassed my mother. And I heard about it, uh, and you know the the weird thing of all that is, years later I went to talk to my mom about that, and she didn't remember it. She didn't even think about it, but it was a big deal to me. And so, as a seven, eight-year-old boy, I I just started going to my room, and I became a bookworm. I could close the door and I could spend hours and hours and hours reading a book. And I got to the point where I was never going to cry again, ever. And I, I made sure that the, that the steel around my heart, if, if, if something would penetrate and hurt, I just made it thicker. I just made it thicker. And, and, and so this, you know, there's, there's no place that's safer than just by yourself in your room, right? But it's also really lonely. It's very lonely. And so uh, there, there, there were times that people would reach out in love, but I just made it thicker. I just made it thicker. I, no one was going to enter. And then one day, this is an allegory, and so, so one day there was, this, there was this hand that started to remove the bricks that I put around my heart, and it kept removing it, and I kept putting it back. And it just knocking on my heart is Jesus. And I, I didn't even look. I didn't even want to look into his eyes. Have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered what it was with Peter when he denied Jesus? And, and, and there was this, in, in the judgment hall, when, when, when he heard the rooster crow, it, it, it gives the idea, the one gospel has the idea that, 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 that Jesus and Peter looked at each other. Do you think Jesus just, just stood there going like this here? Well, you really messed it. No, there was something in his eyes that tore Peter's heart out. It tore his heart out. And it says he went out and he wept bitterly. So this Peter, or, 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 or this little boy who wanted to so much for the walls to stay erect, he, he, he finally, could, he just gave up. And then he looked into his eyes. I figured condemnation. But it wasn't that way. It wasn't that way. And this little boy was made free. This little boy was made free and experienced freedom like never, never before. You know, I... I, After you accept the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you think you're, you're free. I, I thought, wow, this is freedom. And, and I did walk in freedom. But did you know that experiencing healing for your brokenness, I believe, is a lifelong journey? 
It's a lifelong journey. As, as things happen and things in your, you know, you, a lot of things in your past you had no control over. Some things you make, the, I made the wrong decisions and went down wrong paths. But you still get back to this thing of God created you and he wants your all. He wants everything. And so years later, okay, we were, there, again, there was eight of us brothers and we had, uh, we were often not very kind to each other. Did you know that the people closest to you can hurt you the most, right? It's not, I mean, example, so, uh, okay, Marv, this doesn't go for you or, 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 you know. But most of you don't know me very well or at all. And you could go out and say, man, we got this dumb preacher <laughs> that came to preach for us, uh, you don't know me. But if my wife or somebody that knows me well would say stuff like that, it would hurt deeply. So sometimes what happens is it's easier not to be vulnerable. It's easier not to reach out in love for, for fear of it coming back. And so growing up, we knew each other's weaknesses. I had one brother that would, that would wet his bed. And, and, and you know what? When he ticked me off, you know what I would throw at him, right? <laughs> you know, call him names. And, and mine was, I, I, I have a lisp, okay? They called me tongue-tied. And uh, that, that was always the, my, my, uh, the weak point in my armor, if you want to call it that. And, well, I became born again, and, and everything's all good now, right? But... Um, one day I was talking to my secretary, and she was saying how her brother was saying how uh, Merv tells this story, and he says, I can't tell it as funny as Merv does because he's got that, he's tongue-tied, you know, and I couldn't believe how much that hurt. I, I mean, this isn't that long ago, okay? Well, maybe it's been six or seven years ago, I don't know, but I couldn't believe how much it hurt because it took me back to places I didn't want to go. And I, I pasted on a smile and, and kind of said, oh yeah. Uh, but it bothered me to the point where I actually looked in the phone book for a speech therapist. And also realizing that God used my secretary to reveal a hurt. And see, as long as you have a hurt in your heart that you keep, <laughs> I got so many thoughts that want to come here. See, see, as long as you have those hurts in your heart and you keep them and you don't want to bring it to the Lord, it makes you someone that is unable to minister to others that also have hurts in their heart. See, the Bible says that you comfort others with the comfort that you've been comforted with. And so it is only as I give that, and I realize that, and it was an opportunity. I bless my secretary for doing that. Uh, she had no idea, but it gave me an opportunity to bring that up on the altar. And, and you know, the next day she, I mean, she's been my secretary for probably, uh, well, close to 20 years now. And next day she came to me and she said, did I hurt you yesterday? <laughs> I said, you have no clue. And she said, she started crying. She said, we, we, we love you so much and we respect you so much. And I said, it's okay. It was God working with something in my own heart. You know, men, especially men, it's okay to say sometimes that, yes, that did hurt. And yes, you do deal with it and leave it with that instead of saying, oh, no, it's good. Because, see, we, we think the hurt is childish. Uh, we're tough, right? We're tough. Well, some things you need to give to God and let him heal. So I wanted to look at one arrow. Uh, time's getting away from me here. And it's lies. This is probably... The biggest arrow. Because see, when you believe a lie, it's the truth to you. If, if it's, I don't care how off the wall it is. I had, a, I had an employee that worked for me that had a wife. 
that she would look in the mirror and she would see herself as obese and fat and would do those things, you know, uh, gagging after lunch, whatever, bulimia, anorexia is what they call it. And, and he kept trying to tell her that, honey, you are not fat, you're skinny. And she was wilting away. And he would plead with her. And yet she would look in the mirror because see, right between her eyes and her heart, there was a lie. There was a lie. Until the truth sets her free, she's going to believe that lie. I don't care how much you try to explain uh, that it's not that way. It's not that way. And, and so he kept on just begging, you're not fat, dear. You're not fat. And then and, and one day they had to take her to the hospital and put her on IVs or she would have died. And he just threw himself in the bed beside the, 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 room, the, the hospital room bed uh, next to her and just threw himself on there and cried. Why would she not believe him? But see, there was a lie. There was a lie in her heart. Truth is so precious that it is often guarded with lies. Lies. I don't have time to go into... This is an interesting chapter. 1 Kings 13, you have the, the man of God that came to Beth, Bethel or Bethel to prophesy against the altar. And, and the king, uh, Jeroboam, he reaches out to grab him. And as he did, his arm stayed stiff. Just he couldn't retract it. And so then he said, uh, can you pray to God to heal this? And so the man of God from Judea, he, he did. And now the king was enamored. He was like, well, uh, here, uh, why don't you come to my house and get refreshed and I'll give you great gifts and reward and send you on your way. And, and the man said, as the Lord God liveth, he told me not to eat or drink from this, from this land until I get back to my own land. And so the king said, okay, hunky door, have it your way, and off he goes. And well, there was two sons of a prophet that were watching, and they went home and they told their old dad, uh, uh, the, the, a, a, a old prophet, and and said, what happened? And I don't know, did the man say, wow, I remember when God used to talk through me that way. I don't know what happened, but he took off after this man and caught up with him sitting under an oak tree. Now, here's the deal. The longer you sit under an oak tree in a strange land, the hungrier and the thirstier you're going to get. Why was he under an oak tree? Maybe he was thinking, wow, if I could have just went back and ate with him. But here comes this man and he, this old prophet, and he's, Tells him, hey, come back to my house. You must be refreshed and eat and, and drink. And, and, the, and, the God, and, the, and the man of God from Judah gave him the same word as God has said. And, and then the, the old prophet goes, oh, so you're, you're a man of God too. Well, so am I. So am I. And, and you know, an angel told me that you can come to my house and eat. Really? You're, okay, well, hey, brother. And he goes back, and he starts to eat, and then the word of the Lord truly came to the old prophet that deceived him, and he said, because you have done this, you will die before you get back to your country. You will be buried in our sepulchers here, not back with your fathers. And sure enough, the man gets up, he goes out on his donkey, and, and a lion slays him. And then the old prophet goes and he gets the body and he brings him back and it says he mourns over him. I thought, that didn't the wrong guy get punished? But you know the same thing is true for us today. The word of God can say, but you know you can pretty much find any Christian book to justify just about anything you want to do. Is it homosexuality, um, abortion even is justified in, 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 in Christian authors with PhDs behind their uh, name. Did you know evil desires lead to bad theology? So careful, be very careful when people say, oh, I'm a Christian too, hey, uh, but you know, God says this, and, and, and you know the word of God says differently than what he's saying. Very dangerous to start following those theology. Okay, you can go to a Christian bookstore and find material to support 
pretty much whatever you desire. And I made a list. See, if the devil would, I hate to put this on your wall, but if the devil would come looking like this, we would have no issues. We would know to stay away. We would know to, we're, we don't want to get anywhere close to that. Girls, if, 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 if this would be on the covers of romance novels, you wouldn't touch it. Or if this would be on the covers of pornography, you probably wouldn't touch it, right? But it comes in different ways. And the Bible says the devil comes as an angel of light. See, we don't, we're not so scared of this, okay? And, and the scriptures to go with it. 2 Corinthians 11 and 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers... See, this is why you must study the word of God yourself. You can't... I'm sorry, there's... Uh, uh, James, I'm, I'm sure there's great messages coming across this pulpit, but you need to be rooted and grounded and have your own relationship with God because regardless how good the messages are, you need your own relationship. You need your own relationship to, be, to feed on the Word of God yourself. Set your affection in Hebrews 11, verse 10, talking to this great hall of faith, talking about Abraham. Now, now notice, it says, for he looked for a city. See, he had his affection set on something greater than this earth. For he looked for a city which hath its foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, verse 16, further down. But now... They desire a better country, that is, a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So you look, you look on something greater than what is here on this earth. And it seems like, especially as the hour is getting darker and, and, and this nation is in a turmoil, it seems, like, it seems like it's easier to get our focus off on what's above and we start to look at what's happening down here around us and we need to be careful we need to set our affection Abraham had his sights set welcome home this, this, uh, I have two brothers that have passed away my mom and dad are gone I don't know how it is with you but You know, when you, when you get married, you don't really think of these things when maybe the first days you get married, but as you get older, or, or, or maybe I'm the only one in this, but I, I've already pondered which, which one of us is going to go first. You know, if the Lord tarry, we're all going to die someday. And when I think about making it home, you know, when I'm, when I'm gone for a week, there's something about coming home. There's something about coming home, making it home. And so Jesus says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Jesus is offering us the greatest reward To just make it home. To just make it home. I, uh, I think of a, uh, of a man that was walking across the, the field. This is a parable Jesus gave. A man walking across the field and he, and he found this treasure. And, it, and, and one gospel says he kind of you know, looks around and he, and he buries it. And then he goes and sells everything. It says he sold all to come by this field so he could have the treasure. So he sold out. And that's one of the, the, the themes I believe we're going to have this week is just selling out, giving ourselves, giving ourselves to sell out fully for him. And so as we think about this gift, to, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. This, in these couple nights,
as, as we look at the Word of God together, as we... My prayer is that the Holy Spirit would have free course here, that the Holy Spirit would birth in your heart a desire to draw closer to him which loved you more than anyone ever loved you and who gives you a reward of being able to sit with him in his throne if we overcome I've I don't know where you're at in your life um, I'll probably close with prayer here. I, I've always struggled a little bit with altar calls. You know, <laughs> as far as I know, and, and if you know of any other situation, you, you let me know, but as far as I know, Jesus had one altar call, and it was to this rich young ruler who came walking up to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, you know the, the Ten Commandments. And he said, oh, all these things have I kept from my youth. And then he said, this, this was the altar call. He said, go and sell everything and come and follow me. And the, Jesus had one altar call. And the, man, and the one gospel says he loved him. He loved him. And the man walked away sad. See, if I, was, if I was Jesus, I would have said, disciples, can you sing just as I am? Or maybe I would have compromised a little and said, well, you know, I said all, but what about that back 40 that just doesn't really bear much anyway? Can you at least start with that? But he didn't. He let him walk away. He let him walk away. And, and so sometimes I think I cheapen it by... Uh, making it emotional or, or whatever. So I, I want to be very sensitive to that and, and make it to where <laughs> you know exactly what you're walking away from. There's no compromise. See, when we want to compromise, we want to have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. And see, this used to bother me. Jesus said, I would rather you were cold or hot. But, but because you're lukewarm, he will spew you out. And you know what bothers me? That many Christians look at themselves as lukewarm. Yeah, I should be a little hotter. I mean, I realize as I look at my own Christian life, I want to excel more and more in prayer and in reading and in all those godly things. I understand that. But, but on the other hand, when I view myself as a lukewarm Christian, those two shouldn't even be in the same sentence because Christian, what part of spitting out, spewing out, don't we understand? You're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. And so, I've, and we'll talk about this, I think, some more. But So why, why would he rather you were cold? Well, I think I got it. It took me a while, but I think I got it. So, so if you, if you were a, bridegroom and you were standing here and and your bride would be coming up the aisle and and she comes up to you and says dear I love you a lot but but there's this other guy that I love a little bit just a little uh would it be okay if I put a percentage on it maybe two percent of my love is for him and 90, see, I'm bringing you the greater part for you. I, I love you so much more than him. And are you okay if I would spend like maybe one night a year with this guy? What would you say as men? <laughs> yeah, sure, right? No. Why? Because you want her all or not at all. That's the way we are. We want her all or not at all. We, so... So it is with Jesus too. I mean, you, you would say, look, I, I just got here, here, the great man that I am, and you're going to say, I want a little bit of this. So Jesus would rather you would have never known him. He'd rather you were cold than to say, well, yeah, but, you know, I want this too. This is where I think when, when people say that 
an idol is something that you love more than Jesus, think about that for a little bit. So think about if you love your wife or if your wife loves you more than she does this other guy. So, see, when you live in covenant, it has to do with the affections of your heart. It has to do with, see, I'm just as much married, I, I travel a lot to Chicago, I'm just as much married there, away from my wife, as I am at home. And it starts to dictate, it starts to uh, influence everything. Only as we live in covenant, and we'll look at covenant some more, Lord willing, later. So this evening, if you, uh, let's, let's stand for prayer. Father God, you know every person that is here. You know it, the need of every heart. Lord, as, as we are here this evening just, just in front of your throne, we thank you for Jesus for making a way, for Jesus to, to uh, bring us life and life more abundantly. Father, I pray a special blessing upon this congregation as, as we as we stand in, in awe of you, as we learn more about you. Father, I just thank you for allowing me to open up your word once more. Lord, just bless it to our hearts and lives here. And as we, as we anticipate meeting again, that you would bless us together in that way, to just draw us ever closer to you to where we're not satisfied with the things of your hand, but we look for your face. Where the things of the world grow dim because the brightness and the glory of your presence in the church. Lord, bless them to that end. Thank you for all you've done for us and that we can call you Father, which means we can be your children. Bless us to that end. Bless, keep your angels guard around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I don't know if you had... No, I just want to say thank you and what a blessing to be here tonight. Let's uh, continue to pray and seek God's will for this week.